Our gospel for this Sunday comes from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It's found on page 70 in your New Testament if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this day. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is our good news for this day. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to start uh, talking about Advent conspiracy. Uh, we are conspiring together. You've probably maybe heard this word before. We've talked about it maybe two or three years ago. Um, but it's this ongoing program of not trying to ruin your Christmas, not trying to take away all the, the things that you enjoy about Advent and Christmas time, but looking at how we can reconnect with what Christmas was originally, and looking at how we can make your Advent and Christmas season more meaningful, more purposeful, not just a time to be survived, uh, but a time to grow and live in. So I'm going to show you the, the Advent Conspiracy introduction video, uh, and, and it'll help to sum up a little bit about what we're talking about.
I didn't make one. <laughs> so we begin at the beginning. Two beginnings, actually. We heard from the beginning in Genesis, and then we come to the beginning in John. And both beginnings start out so simply. Genesis leads out, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, deep with a wind from God, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. It's hard to imagine that moment when it all began, but you can picture the darkness beginning to break as the winds of God blow across it. I don't know if it's cold or warm wind, but when you picture it, you should be feeling one thing, an emotion, excitement, possibility, hope. And John picks right up on that. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. It's hard to really understand that. What it means for someone to be light and life for the people. But we've all been in that moment, either really or figuratively, where the dark was all around us. And we can't take it anymore. And then whether literally or figuratively, we flip the light switch on and the bloody glow pours into our hearts and we are brimming with possibility. We joyfully look around the room and seeing what the light has revealed. What next? I always try to think back to my earliest Christmas memory. It always starts the same way. It starts on Christmas Eve, late at night, my family is walking up the sidewalk to the church, and then there are those luminaries. Little bags with sand that have things cut out of them, and one light in there, and it's lighting the way as we enter into the church. And every time I picture in my head, a crisp winter wind blows across them. It's enough to make the bags move, but it's, it's not that it makes me feel cold, it's that it makes the air feel magic. Like something's about to happen. And inside the sanctuary, it's dark. Except for a little light coming from the altar area and then wrapping around all the windows and hanging over the ceiling are Christmas lights. The whole building is aglow with what looks like fireflies. And then we start to sing. And I always remember that the memories are when I was young. And I always remember that when we start to sing, it's finally songs I know. <laughs> Christmas carols. All the Christmas carols that I've been listening to really throughout the year, but I can finally admit it come Christmas time. And then an unthinkable bit of magic happens. Isn't it? My whole family is smiling there. My dad starts to sing. My dad doesn't sing ever, but he'll sing Christmas carols. You can see the whole family is in that moment watching the lights dance. Pastor preaches for too long, but that's not, you know, not his fault. <laughs> and then we leave, and, and you can feel that energy as we're going home, as we're picturing tomorrow. And taste the feeling of laying in bed trying to force myself to sleep so that tomorrow will come sooner. But I can't. Christmas morning and the joys of going to grandma's house and playing with my cousins and eating all of those cookies overwhelm me and it takes me a long, long time to fall asleep. I remember every bit and piece of that so distinctly. They are some of my strongest memories. But you know what I can't remember? 
a single present I was given on Christmas morning. I've been trying. I've been trying the last few weeks to think of one. Was that, or no, was that a birthday? Or was there a bike under the tree at some, or was that my sister? But as an adult now, or as someone that's been told a number of times I should act like an adult, <laughs> when I picture the coming Christmas season, I'm not picturing luminaries, Christmas lights, carols, expecting to lay in bed, being so excited, picturing long lines, credit card bills, traffic, managing schedules, toddler tantrums. <laughs> and for what? To give my kids the Christmas I got? Well, look at the Christmas that I got. Not the one I actually received, but the one that I remember. It has nothing to do with stuffism, consumerism, that has claimed our Christmas cycle. It has everything to do with the people that surrounded me, the relationships. It had everything to do with the people that were important to me. And the experience, not the stuff, that it built the last. This is what we lose sight of when we tell the Christmas story. Because when we think about the gifts that were given on that first Christmas morning, we think about those wise men. They saw a crying baby in a manger with the parents who were too poor, uh, too poor to afford much of anything. And instead of giving them blankets and onesies and baby bottles, they give them gold and frankincense and myrrh. Oh, incense. Thank goodness you showed up, wise men. I was worried about what I was going to feed the baby, but now I have this incense to cover up the manure smell. Thank goodness you showed up. And then the story tells us they leave. I mean, that's the first thing we hear about the Christmas story and presents is the wise men show up, give them gifts they don't need, and then they take off. <laughs> Thank you, wise men. But John doesn't start his story out that way. He doesn't start his story out with traditional gifts. He doesn't start out with that time that God rewarded him financially or when God called him out of the woods and laying in front of him was that perfectly wrapped present with just the nicest bow. John talks about the greatest gift that we can give, the greatest gift that we have been given, the gift not of presents with a T, but a presence with a seed. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. God could and does give us stuff, because God gave us the world and all our stuff comes from the world. The stuff doesn't last. I have a single box of stuff from my childhood that I can't bring myself to throw away. But none of it came from Christmas. Almost none of it was a present. And if you added it all up, probably it doesn't even probably add up to 1% of the stuff that I had over the course of my lifetime. When we think about what we actually need, what we desire, what we're hurting for. After you have food and water and shelter. Companionship and a God that is not far away. A God that understands what it means to be us. Not just from some abstract place of having all knowledge, but someone that lived as us. I get, all, I get asked all the time what my favorite Bible passage is. I think it's, you know, it's that go-to when you're meeting a pastor and you don't know what to say next. It's like, so the Bible, huh? <laughs> and I have some verses that I usually throw out, uh, you know, usually as a joke or try and, you know, talk about something else. Not that I don't like talking about the Bible, but that's all we're going to talk about. 
And if I get really hard pressed, usually I'll say something like, I don't like to take the Bible out of context when they stare at me weird. <laughs> but if I really have to answer, if I really think hard about this question, and probably the reason I don't answer it all that often, is that my favorite Bible verse is something Jesus says when he's quoting a psalm. He's on the cross and Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now you're all looking at me weird. That's why I don't tell people my favorite verse. All the time. <laughs> but we have a God that understands what it's like to be us. Even to the point of feeling like God has abandoned you. How could God, even with all knowledge, possibly know what that's like while being God? And yet finally, here in this moment, we see the true nature of our gift. We have a God that understands us even to the point of not knowing where God is. That's our gift of that presence. That's the gift that we open on Christmas morning and enjoy throughout the year. And it's the gift that we are meant to pass on. We are meant not to give people stuff they don't need, but to give people ourselves, our time, stuff they do need, the stuff they will remember, the hope and excitement and joy that only this time of year can create. So as we move into this Advent season, and as we conspire to hear these origin stories of Jesus, the origin stories of our Christian faith, I invite you to think about reshaping and reforming your Advent and Christmas practices. Holding on to that which is dear. Holding on to that which brings you most joy. But looking to see how you can bring in not more stuff, but more relationship. More of the joy that came that first Christmas morning, more community, more hope, a return to the true meaning of Christmas. Amen. Amen.